It's, it's not an angry mob, though. It is uh, people who came down to the studio to watch the show. Welcome to the Atheist Experience. We are live. Uh, today is Sunday, August 12th. Yes. 2018. Uh, that's when we're recording it. You might be watching it 30 years in the future, in which case I'd like to apologize in advance for a number of things, but I, I, I don't get to control the entire world. Hopefully you guys are all doing well. This is a live show that we produce, sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin. You can go to atheist-community.org to find out more about it. Uh, I'm your host. I'll put that in quotes this week because it, it, it never really applies. It's like there's two people here. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm Matt Delaney. Joining me this week, Jen Peoples. You have two former presidents of the organization that sponsors That's this. Right. We will tear you up. <laughs> no. Uh, I do want to make a quick announcement, and then we'll talk a little bit about Pride, which was yesterday. Yes. Uh, but the next big event for the Atheist Community of Austin, which you can find out more information about at atheist-community.org, is the annual bat cruise. Uh, Austin, for those who don't know, has the largest metropolitan bat population on the planet, uh, a million well, to a million and a In North half. America, anyway. Okay. Yeah. Are there metropolitan areas outside of North America? Yeah, there are. Okay. Gosh, I'm just a stupid American. What do I know? There's like uh, all over. Anyway, there's yeah. like a million, million and a half bats living yeah. under the Congress Street Bridge. Every year we rent a boat, we go out and have a good time. And on the day of that, we also do events mm -hmm. to kind of turn it into more of a day. Turn it into a destination location for godless heathens like Mecca, uh, only with, you know, tequila. <laughs> and uh, this year, there's going to be actually two events uh, on that day at noon. I'm going to be doing my Magic and Skepticism show. Wait, 10? 10, yeah. 10 oh, to that's noon. right. I did tell you guys I would get up and do this shit at a ridiculous hour. Yeah, 10 to noon. Yeah, 10 to noon, and then there's a break. And then you can actually skip that. If you don't want to be up at 10, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> but then, then we're going to have uh, Mandisa Thomas, uh, the founder of Black Nonbelievers, here to give the keynote address and then come out on the boat and hang out with everybody. Uh, tickets are going fast. Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, <laughs> I was told the other day that I better get one. Yeah. And I was like, wait a minute. I'm, I'm doing a show. Should I? You guys aren't going to comp me a ticket to the... Okay, whatever. But we're looking forward to that. And if you are an atheist or atheist-friendly person who's going to be in the Austin area around September 22nd, uh, or actually on that day, because if you're there around it, then you won't be able yeah, to come. You have to be there it. on that day. Uh, but get your tickets quick. And also, the quicker this sells out, that lets us know if next year we might need to do two boats, which I'm told we almost did this year. Yeah. Uh, but it's great. It's a kind of BYOB thing, can't bring glass bottles, or maybe now you can. Yeah, yeah, you can. I, I asked them about that um, a couple years ago, and they said, no, that's never been a rule. We don't know where the people came up with that. But you can bring glass bottles on the boat. Cool. I will be bringing a glass bottle on yeah, the boat. Yeah, just don't break them. Yeah. So anyway, that's a, the big event that's coming up for the ACA. In addition to this program, the ACA uh, also has a number of other programs, and the, the list of programs produced by the Atheist Community of Austin is growing at a rate that I cannot possibly keep up with. Uh, if you like what's going on here, there's a atheist, or it's patreon.com slash the atheist experience uh, is the information about how to contribute to this show, but we're also producing uh, Talk Heathen, Godless Woo! Bitches. Um, <laughs> Oh my gosh! There's there's still the non Mr. Atheist. There's, there's nonprofits. There's uh, preaching humanists. There's now secular secular sexuality. I don't know what they yeah, call it. Yeah, there's a parenting show. We got a parenting a, show. We got a sex show. Yeah. You should watch the sex show before the parenting show, so that you know yeah. how to become maybe, a parent. Maybe you should watch the parenting show before the sex show. So, so you know if you want to become. A parent. You'll be inspired to use birth control. Yes. Yeah, and then you go to the other one to get instruction on how to do it right and what's nonsense yeah. and everything else. <laughs> it's, it's just so exciting because, uh, you know, having more and more content to cover larger areas, there's more and more people showing up on the other side. Actually, we're, we're packed over there. There's literally no room yeah. left to sit. Um, so if you're planning on coming down today, don't. No. No, you can still you, come down. You can. There's still room in the back room or you can stand outside and then we do uh, dinner of some sort or some sort of gathering after the show's over here at the building, and they will have the address up right at the bottom of the screen there. That's all I have to say. All right. How are you, and how was Pride? Oh, Pride was awesome. I'm sorry I missed it. I, know. I even have yes. a colored beard. It would have been awesome. So every year, for those who are unaware, every year um, the ACA sponsors a booth at Pride, and it's 
always good to get out in communities that we don't often interact directly with because we get a lot of face-to-face -face interaction with people. And one of the most common things of, that we heard yesterday was people coming up to us saying, oh, we didn't know you guys um, existed here in Austin. And the ACA has been in existence for over 20 years now. So obviously we still need to do more outreach in the local community um, to, to let people know we're here. People were delighted to discover that we are very LGBTQ friendly here. So if you are in the community and you want to come hang out with us, please do. We're um, here. Some of us are queer. Yeah, some of us are hang queer. Hang out with us. Yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Uh, Phil Session and I um, usually are the two running the Pride booth. Uh, we had a lot of great volunteers uh, that helped us out. So we had basically um, a full cast of volunteers the whole time. So it wasn't just me and Phil grinding it out the whole day in the booth in the sweltering heat. Um, speaking of which, yesterday was interesting. Um, started out like a sauna with the humidity and, and the sweltering heat. And then we had a brief respite from that when the cold front came through and the wind kicked up a little bit. And then it started pouring on us. So Phil has posted a picture of the last five of us as we were loading out all the gear, and we are soaked, but it's still a great time. So next year, come out to Pride, check us out. Awesome. Right. I, w I missed it the last couple of years because I was traveling. This year I'm in town and got, there's a bunch of stuff going on, but I got completely yeah. distracted. Otherwise, I would have loved to have gone out there. Yeah. One of these days they're going to do it when it's not crazy hot. You know, last year, actually, they did it when it wasn't crazy hot, but that's because the original Pride weekend, the hurricane hit. Yep. So they moved it to October, and it was not ridiculously hot in October. Um, this year, eh, we had some weather to deal with, but still not too bad. One thing I did notice this year that's different from years past is that there were no protesters, and I'm not sure why that is. I'm actually going to reach out to some, some of the Pride organizers and find out if it's because the police told them to go away or if they just didn't show up this year. But we actually were anticipating more protesters this year and more aggressive protesters. There were none. Yeah, a couple of years ago, I got into it with some of the protesters. Um, he thought that calling my wife a whore was going to upset me. And when it didn't actually upset me, it just yeah. showed how monumentally ignorant he is about my wife and about uh, why the word whore shouldn't be a pejorative in the first damn place. Right. Um, but it was, it was fun to have those conversations. I would, I'd love to find out that the protesters are just not coming because they've given up. Yeah. Because that now you're actually getting to normalcy, which it might be a good idea. Um, and because I know that, that you will be the expert at this, one of the things that comes up every year, not only, hey, we didn't know you were here, it's why on earth would your group be participating with this in the first place? What, what do the two have to do with each other? Yeah. Uh, the LGBTQ community is um, right now an ongoing target for the culture warriors out there. I mean, and especially the trans members of the community um, with the bathroom bills that have proliferated um, and just basically trying to make it as, as difficult as possible to be trans in public. Um, they're trying to erase trans people. And so that's the latest assault. But there's also other stuff. I mean, there's, there's people, me included, who are seriously worried about the future of marriage equality in this country because of some of the things that are going on. Um, we have legislators who are, are mandating that if a child comes out to a teacher or a counselor at school, they're trying to require the teacher to notify the parents. So basically telling educators they have to out kids to their parents. Well, if the kids were comfortable talking to their parents about this, they would have told them. You know? And so there's an ongoing assault, and a lot of it is motivated by religion. I wonder if there's a way to use the rough equivalent of like HIPAA laws to counter that. Yeah, I don't know. Um, th that would be an interesting approach. Because uh, HIPAA laws relate to medical conditions. Medical Your conditions, doctor can't yeah. re reveal any information about you um, to anybody. Uh, there are exceptions when you... Uh, maybe, right. maybe even exceptions with guardians. As soon as you add yeah. parents to the mix, things get complicated because 
there, the general public has this view of parenthood as if you own the child. Yeah. That's inaccurate. You are a steward of that child, and if the rest of society deems you to be an unfit steward, you don't get to keep your kid. Right. And the idea that you are responsible for this life does not mean that you have some right to know everything about that life. That thing, that life. I think it's good, I think it's healthy for everybody to have secrets, including kids, mm -hmm. and that you should never be forced to talk to anybody about anything that you're not comfortable talking to them about. Right. Well, and, that, and it's interesting because, you know, my son is still fairly young. He's 12. But if I, you know, sent him in to see a doctor and he spoke to the doctor about whatever was on his mind in confidence, um, as far as I know, that doctor is um, not only not obligated, but may not even be allowed to talk to me about the specifics about that other than basically whatever I can glean from the billing. Yeah, uh, it, and it may be, there may, like I say, I, I'm not remotely a legal expert on this. There may be exceptions with parents. I'm not even a parent, so I should just shut up. Well, and, and the thing is, I know that there are age, um, like, restrictions. So, and, and I don't know what it is in Texas, but there, you know, if the child is at the point of being at the age where they can consent to medical treatment on their own, then I think they also have a medical right to privacy Yes, about that. And so... Um, you know, I, I think 12 is probably under that age, but still, I mean, I wouldn't want to restrict my son's conversation with a physician because he didn't want me to know what he was talking about to his doctor. Yeah, but it, like in, in your situation or in mine, if I was in a similar one, if I was taking my kid into the doctor, I would say the doctor is someone you can talk to. And if you tell the doctor something that you don't want me to know, yeah. then tell the doctor that. And when I talk to the doctor later, I, I will make sure that I say, only tell me things that my right. kid wants me to know because I don't... I want you to feel open enough to talk to me about anything, and I would hope that if I had a kid, right. they would they would feel that way. But the way to shoot that down immediately right. is to make is to to overstep that bounds and say, no, 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 I'm going to find this out. If he, it, parenting is difficult enough, right. and nobody is an expert, and nobody knows how to do it, you're going to fuck your first kid up, guarantee. <laughs> it's. There will be therapy. It's well, it's a virtual well, guarantee. The thing is, though, it, it, it it's it's something that you you learn it. Everybody learns it the same way, and it's on the job in real time. There's no like, there's no parenting class that can prepare you. Other people's kids. For, uh, Watching what other people do with their yeah. kids has taught me a lot about what I would potentially do with mine. Yeah, and so, I will still get it wrong. I mean, yeah, and it, and I mean, my kid may be going to therapy because of what happened yesterday. I, every year at Pride, I I get a handful of condoms, you know. And last year, I tried to give them to him, and he was just like, no, 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 no. So this year, I go up, and I'm like, you know what a condom is, right? And he's like, yeah, I know what a condom is. So I give him the handful of condoms, and I, and I said, these are yours, and I know you don't need them yet, but... The wrapper on one of them has instructions for how to use it. And you may get curious about how to do this. And if you do, I want you to practice. So here's your condoms for you to practice. And he's looking at me in horror, like, no. And, and I said, I just want you to know how to use one long before you ever need it. And so that's the whole point. And I gave it to him, and he's standing there. He's holding this handful of condoms, and he's like, I don't feel comfortable holding these. So I'm going to put these over here. <laughs> and he set them down. In a few minutes, he's like, I'm going to take these and put them in my room. <laughs> I was like, they're uh, yours. You can do whatever you want with them. <laughs> so. so Jen and I were talking before the show, and she told me that story. And despite the fact that I am, you know, liberal, left-wing, progressive, whatever else, there's still this thing in my head that's like, oh, at what age would you give, you know, and everything yeah. else. And it's not a judgy thing. It's thinking about it. And then I realized my dad started teaching me how to drive when I was nine mm -hmm. or possibly earlier. We, we had uh, a few acres. And what he would do is we had a, both a truck and a tractor. And yeah. every now and then he'd go get one of them stuck. And one day he's yelling at me and the tractor's stuck down there. And he reaches in his pocket and he throws me the keys. And he's like, go up and get the truck and come down here and pull me out. And I was like, yeah. wait, you want me to drive the truck down the hill to the pond and pull? Yes, hurry up. <laughs> and it was just so matter of fact, 
he knew I'd been watching, he knew I'd been paying attention, I can reach the pedals, I'm not driving on a road, I'm driving, you know, basically in our backyard. And so I go down and I pull the truck out, or pull the tractor out. And he played this game off and on, and he was intentionally getting one or the other struck, stuck, and then he would send me for the other. Mm-hmm. So that by the time that I was legally allowed to drive, driving was nothing. And if right. you think about it, you know, I know that in, in certain places in Europe and other things, um, alcohol use amongst minors, it's a, it's a family thing. Right. And so they have fewer problems with people running off to university and <laughs> dropping out because all they do is right. drink themselves into oblivion. Um, it just seems this is just another example of get your kids prepared. Right. And maybe, maybe. You won't have to deal with some of the problems that other parents who don't prepare their kids have to deal with. Right. And that's the thing. It's like, uh, you know, I'm I'm not going to supervise his practice sessions. I don't really, I don't need to know about that. That's his business. Um, but I want him to know that condom use is expected. It, I expect that he'll have sex at some point, you know, not in the next year, I hope. Um, but, you know, certainly when he's in high school. And I want him to be prepared, and that's all that is. And he doesn't ever have to talk to me about that. But, you know, if he needs condoms, he can come say, hey, Mom, I need some more condoms, and I'll get them for him. No questions asked. You know what we need to do? What's that? We need to clear out some of the calls that are in the queue so that the lines open up so all the people who are pissed off about what we just said can call in a little later in the show. Good idea. Let's take calls. So on that note, we're going to go to calls, and we have um, on line three, it's Doc. Welcome to the show. You're on with Matt and Jen. Well, hello. How are you today? Doing well. Right. How are you? I'm good. Um, I heard uh, Matt call Matt's program several times. I've been listening on the air. Uh, one comment I want to make about what you were saying previously: kids don't come with instruction manuals. That's so, true. That, that's true. <laughs> yeah, I had I had three of my own, and uh, I don't know about ten grandchildren now. So none of them came with instruction manuals. Anyway. And they're not all the same, so you'd need a new manual for every kid no, pretty yeah. much, too. Yeah, you, yeah you're going to have to figure each one out. Anyway, uh, the question, basically the question I had was, uh, I was, like I said, I've been listening to the program for a couple of years now, and it seems to me that Matt was, now I know you were previously a Christian, yeah. and it seems to me that uh, you've stated on numerous occasions that you don't think the Bible is a, a valid source of information. Is that is that correct? Am I am I reading that correctly? Not quite. I think the way I would Not phrase quite. it is that, generally speaking, um, no individual source is is going to be viewed as an authoritative final um, a, a source on its own. So there are things in the Bible that I have no problem with that I accept are, okay. are, you know, even factual information about things that might have happened in the past, where viewing it as a historical document, um, I certainly think that it's probably right, but it's based on independent confirmation that we have from other sources and what we generally know about the past. It's not like I, it's not like I view the Bible as if it's an entirely fictional fantasy book that was written that way. Okay. It is, if, if, if the Bible talks about, you know, this happened at some point in the city, and it's an entirely mundane occurrence, then I'm perfectly fine with the idea that it's likely to be correct. I would certainly want as much independent corroboration as we could find. And if if it it turns out that, you know, there's good reason to think it's not true, um, then I would dismiss that. So it's just just a matter of it not being, hey, the Bible says it, so I believe it. That should never be the case for, for that book or any book. Okay. Well, the, that was, that was, yeah, that's part of my, uh, my question. And was it, if, if the Bible, um, wh- what it says about God's instructions for treatment of other people, uh, what about that aspect of it? I have no reason to think that there's a God or that a God gave instructions or that the Bible is accurately representing what God's instructions are. Okay. If I don't believe in a then, God, then clearly I can't believe the Bible is accurately relaying his instructions. Oh, okay. Okay. Then, uh, then uh, I've also heard you condemning the instructions that God supposedly God gave concerning slavery. Yes. And, yes. Uh, my my question is that if you don't think the God that 
the Bible is an accurate uh, description of what God, how God's instructions, then how can you use the Bible to condemn God's instructions on slavery? I, I, what I'm doing is pointing out that the Bible says things that any reasonable person would view uh -huh. as immoral, and yet the believers are simultaneously pointing to God as a perfect moral authority, and then yeah. uh, not addressing the fact that they disagree with whether or not you should own people as property. It's, it's to yeah. point out the hypocrisy in individuals. It's not to point out any hypocrisy with God. I think that right. pretty much everybody is yeah. morally superior to the character of God in the Bible. Oh, all right. I, I think I tend to agree with you there. Uh, so are, are you a just, believer or, or? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a believer. I'm a, well, I'm a Lutheran. Okay. Uh, and um, I t I've sort of rationalized parts of the Bible. And I figured, I, could, I did the one story, and I figured uh, if I can rationalize that this way, then the, the, the other stories are going to be similar, so why bother? So I, I went through the account of Noah's flood, and I, I totally disagree with how some literalists uh, will try to portray that account and uh, say, you know, the, the entire world, no, the entire world was not flooded. I don't agree with that at all. And you're going get, to get phone calls and comments on this, and no doubt, but... That's uh, actually, so it's only... The only people who really go for a the entire world was flooded are a very uh -huh. small group of right. literalist fundamentalists. Most most liberal right. and moderate Christians have found a way to oh maybe it's a bit metaphor, maybe it's a bit you know maybe mm -hmm. the story didn't happen, but there's something important we're supposed to glean from it. And right. while I can appreciate that, you, the problem with that is the literalists. Uh -huh. no matter how wrong they ultimately are, have a foundation that they can point to yeah. and say, this is what it says, and I believe it. And everybody else right. who's finding a way to massage the text to be more comfortable for them have no foundation mm -hmm. apart from their own selves, that, right. uh, what their preference right. is, which right. means they are putting themselves above the divinely inspired word of God. And if, and if, they're, if they're simultaneously saying, I believe that God has inspired the Bible... And I believe that I have the correct understanding or interpretation of it. Then now they're in a bit of a quandary because they put themselves above the text. Yeah, well, I, I'm not sure. I I believe that the the text was a direct um, interpretation of what God God said, and th and that's so fine. I'm, I'm, but here's here's the what? little problem. Yeah. Now you've got a text. And mm -hmm. you are in a position to say, okay, I don't believe that it was all inspired by God. And uh -huh. then you have to go through and figure out which parts were and weren't and come up with a way that you right. know that to be the case. And if, if you can't do that for any portion of it, now you're left with zero foundation for any of your beliefs mm -hmm. to identify as a Christian or a Lutheran, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which, which okay. is interestingly enough how... Um, how I started seriously questioning um, my belief right. system. I was asking well, these questions of people, hey, how do you know what was, you know, just a story that was meant to convey some kind of, you know, moral message yeah. versus what is literally true? And yeah. the people I was asking could not answer the question. And when they well, could uh, answer the yeah. question, they couldn't give me any kind of... Um, rationale that would make sense that basically would give me a repeatable method for evaluating claims in the Bible. There's there's something and, and I, I will let you speak in just a second it just popped into my head. Go ahead. The reason most people get rid of the flood account saying that it didn't, you know, literally cover the entire planet is because right. we have a good enough scientific understanding about the way you yeah. know things like that work that it seems to right. violate what we understand about science. That, mm -hmm. that, Oh yeah, I, and yet, I I agree a hundred percent with that. And yet, if you um, if you disregard the flood on that foundation, wouldn't you also have to disregard a resurrection on that foundation? Um, it, I'm not totally disregarding the flood. 
if, if I can explain. Sure. Okay. If you have a few minutes, I can explain. All right. Um, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> excuse me. The uh, the interpretation of the version I've read, and I, and I haven't read the original uh, text in the original language, so I, I'm only going by hearsay on that. But what I what I did read was, uh, I think, the King James Version, where they said that the first thing is they said that Noah walked with God. And I interpret that as to mean that Noah was able to, was attuned to nature. He was attuned to the the signs of nature, knew what was coming, uh, could read the natural phenomena. See, you've taken that further than... Like the wild animals do. You've, you've taken that further than most people would. Um, so, I, yeah, I'm I'm sure I am. I, a, a literalist. And I'll tell you the truth. I I don't I don't say this out loud very often. Yeah, no, so, no. I'm just saying. So, th- just for the for the audience, because I I know where you're yeah. at. Uh, so, a, pro- a a serious literalist would read something like Noah walked with God and be like, oh, mm-hmm. Noah walked with God, like literally, you know. Right. Uh, yeah. And yet, if you read and understand more about. Judaism and, and Christianity and things like that, um, that doesn't really make sense. And so the general, the kind of the normative understanding of Noah uh-huh. walked with God is Noah was a godly man. Noah's actions and deeds were in keeping with what God wanted him to do, despite the fact that he right. was, you know, a lousy drunk. Right. <laughs> well, whatever. <laughs> yeah. And uh, then then you get to the part where it says he took two of all Two of all kinds of unclean and seven of all kinds of clean animals, and and I'm I'm saying he took the animals he knew about, and he he built the I think he built as the scriptures say he built the ark on top of a a hill, so he herded his livestock up there, and where are the wild animals going to go in the time of the flood up the hill, so all the wild animals in the area came to him. He put them on the ark. Um, now, if 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 you take the ark literally as as big as it, they said it was, and I I don't quite agree with that, but allow for uh, what thirty foot depth, I think it was. Um, say about half of that is underwater, half of that is above water, so it's about fifteen feet above water. He's standing on the deck. How far can you see to the horizon from uh, that far above the water? I figured it out one time. It's about 30 miles. So if you see... The horizon at sea miles, level is about 12 miles. At sea level? Well, at sea level, yeah, but he's if, above if, sea level. If you're on a boat, you're at sea level. Yeah. Well, the boat is, yeah. But he's... Uh, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Here a little bit. That was just it, me yeah, being in the anyway, Navy for eight years. I, I calculated it out at, at this time, and, he, and I figured it about 30 miles to the horizon. Plus, if you go beyond that, the, a mountaintop has to be well beyond the horizon, or you'd see it. So he couldn't see anything. And so w- whether it's w- whatever name you give him, Noah or whatever... Uh, he couldn't see anything but water wherever he looked. So as far as he was concerned, all the world was flooded. Here, here's, here's, and, here are the 25,000 problems with what you've just done, Doc. Okay. Go First ahead. of all, Noah didn't write this account. It, it, and, no. and nowhere is this account portrayed as Noah writing this account. It, it, it's portrayed as Moses writing this account. But you're also basically, you've now reduced the global flood which was supposed uh-huh. to be a judgment on humankind. And uh-huh. you've reduced it to some guy built a boat, grabbed the animals that were around him and floated around for a while. Now, uh-huh. you have supposedly Almighty God who's inspiring a book that is supposed to teach people mm-hmm. what he wants. And the message that this is supposed to teach is, I have destroyed all of mankind except for this one righteous family who will repopulate the earth. If you reduce this to Almighty God flood, flooded a small region and had one family grab their local belongings and the animals that made it to them in a boat, it has no impact on the broader story right. at all because a local flood is nothing. Right. And this is, 
This so is what is what I'm, what then is the purpose of God inspiring a book, including a story that is irrelevant and prone to misunderstanding if it was actually a local flood? See, what you're doing is okay. is you're looking at this and saying, there needs to be something here that's true. Let me find a way to make this acceptable mm -hmm. and plausible to me. And yeah. that means that there's a bias there that you're looking for truth when it may be mm -hmm. this is just fiction. And, yeah. and, and this is I, I, before we even get into the problems of creating a wooden boat the size of the right. ark. Well, he was opposed to the, the size, too. He doesn't buy the size. <laughs> well... I mean, he, he basically massaged out all yeah. the problems so that now you've got. You know. Yeah. But I mean, do you yeah. think the boat was bigger or smaller? I, I have no idea how big it actually was. Okay. And, and but, on, on what uh, basis do you challenge the size that is listed? Why do you think there was a boat at all? Yeah. Well, uh, um, there were, there have been, and this has been pointed out, there have been flood stories throughout the ages. Sure. Yes. Epic of Gilgamesh. Just another flood. Yes. Yeah. Just another flood story. And it just, someone, um, I think part of it is that they had to uh, impress their audience. So it's like like every other story in the Bible, they had to take, you've you, you got to understand, they were Stone Age savages writing to Stone Age savages. But they didn't write and it. They had to. And, and uh, not Stone Age, but I'll, get, I'll grant you the, well, the hyperbole. Well, Age, whatever. Yeah. And, uh, but they had to impress those people why with by exaggerating why the the facts why how else were they going to reach them isn't how it god's make them it, isn't it god's story? job to reach people why it, okay well, here's here's the thing if you want to take stories like this and say these were constructs of men who were trying to impress people and that's mm -hmm. going to be true for all of the religions that you reject as well Right. Th then what's the reason for accepting any portion of this? Well, I, there's there's only there's only one reason really. And that is because uh, because it makes you feel good, like you said, and uh, yeah. The, the I mean, problem is it's comfortable. Don't I, uh, I'm always I'm always baffled by people, and and I get I'm not. I'm not trying to hammer you on this point too much, Doc. It's, yeah. for me, I care far more about whether something's true than whether it's comforting uh -huh. or makes me feel good. Because there are lots yeah. of things that make me feel good, which are actually bad for me and bad for society. And yeah. if your reason for believing is that it makes you feel good, what if you believe things that make you feel good that are ultimately harmful to you and other people? That that you have to determine, and uh, pretty much on an individual an individual basis. And I I always I've always contended that um, ethics or morality is situational. Uh, it depends on the situation. Yeah, we're we're uh, we're completely in agreement there. It's just that w yeah. what is it? I had I had. I guess one, I'm, I guess what I need guy. to find out, Doc, is if you could as briefly as possible because. You know, the yeah. show doesn't last for. What is it you believe, <laughs> and what is it that you that makes you feel good about it? Well, I, I first of all, I believe that there is a God, um, and I I don't believe that uh, because I don't have evidence or proof. Uh, I have had an experience many, many, many years ago that uh, of the Holy Spirit that I couldn't explain any other way. Okay. And I figured if the Holy Spirit exists, then God must exist. So um, you, you say you had an experience with the Holy Spirit that you couldn't explain any other way. The, uh -huh. the fact that you couldn't explain it any other way doesn't mean you've explained it. No, no, it doesn't. But uh, it was in a, 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 a large auditorium with a lot of people there. and Me too. You know, I, I didn't get to talk to anybody else about it, but... Uh, well, well, I actually I did. You you had an experience. There, I had this on tape. You you, you had an experience, and when it was over, uh -huh. you you the only thing you were left with was that must have been the Holy Spirit. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah, right. The thing is, I've had an experience that at the time uh -huh. I was convinced the only explanation could be the Holy Spirit, and then later on I realized uh -huh. 
that's not an explanation, and I had no good reason to put forth that as even a candidate explanation. It is yeah. one of those things where I don't know what this is, but people around me have had similar experiences, and they say it's the Holy Spirit, so I'll go with that. And eventually, yeah. when I decided that I cared more about whether something was true than whether it felt good, I had to realize that the experiences that I had previously attributed to the Holy Spirit were experiences for which I either didn't have an explanation, still don't, or for which there's a mundane explanation that, you know, when you have a whole bunch of people standing there singing and praising and you feel euphoric and goosebumps, that this is playing into things that we as human beings experience. It's not just religious music or religious experiences that make us feel mm -hmm. like that. We can have that from secular music and from drugs and, you know, all, all sorts yeah. of things. Doc, was that the context of when you had this experience? Um, well, there was no, no music. It was part of a service. Okay. But there was no music at the time. Um, actually, when when the the entire disturbance started, everything else stopped, and everybody was listening to what was happening, what was going on. Uh, and when it finally did settle down, uh, a girl sang out, or stood up and sa uh, sang something in a language I don't recognize, so I assume it was singing in tongues. And then she sang the translation. So, well, see, now okay. that's weird. Sort of fits. Yeah. That sort of fits. Uh, hey, Doc. The, how yeah. do you how do you know she translated it right? I don't. I don't. All so, I do is so you, I, could, I could go back to the tape and uh, listen to it if I could if I could get a hold of it. But the, uh, the thing is, so as soon as we get into glossolalia, so they're speaking in tongues, there's a couple different schools here. One is that the uh, it's a language that you cannot understand, which means she couldn't have uh -huh. sung a translation. And then the other one is this notion that people could potentially translate it. The problem with the second one yeah. is that you can test that. Uh, you can ask people to translate again. You can ask people, uh, you know, if, if there's some understanding there, then we can test for what this language is, and we could potentially reconstruct it because we understand how language works. Um, right. But at the end of the day, what you're saying is something happened, somebody babbled, uh -huh. and then they told you what the babbling meant. Right. Blah, blah, blah. And let me tell you what that means. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You do not have a sound epistemological foundation to have a sound epistemological foundation to accept my explanation as if it was a translation. That's correct. I agree. So, <laughs> and and, and I, I appreciate that, Doc. But you're you're only agreeing. Af I mean, after I pointing this out. And yet, I bet if I asked you tomorrow, are mm -hmm. you convinced that you had an experience with the Holy Spirit, you would still say yes. Yeah, I would. Because that's what it felt like. And there was... There how, was how do you know what an experience with the Holy Spirit feels like? There's... there's Well, I don't... Uh, okay. Just... So, so there's an episode of Blackadder um, that has a line in it that is my favorite in, to apply in this situation. Mm -hmm. And Blackadder is standing there and Percy is talking about the the eyes of the uh, so-and-so and how blue they are. And they say that they are bluer than the, the blue stone of Galveston or whatever. I'm going to butcher it. And at the end of this wow. long thing, it turns out that Percy's never seen the, the Infanta's eyes and he's never seen the <laughs> stone of Galveston. And so Blackadder looks at him and says, so what you're saying is that something you've never seen is slightly less blue than something else you've never seen. <laughs> yeah. This is what you're doing. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Also, uh, what um, the guy, the char character that plays uh, Blackadder. Rowan Atkinson. his name? Rowan Atkinson, yeah. yeah. He did a sequence on um, where he played a a pastor. Yeah, he did a lot of stand-up in that. He's an atheist, by the way. Yeah, he did a lot of stand-up on that, and he did one sequence, and uh, he, he did this sequence where he did the opening speech at a convention. And uh, if you... He, he's basically saying God is mysterious, and we shouldn't question him. So... You know what? 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 I don't know what else I can say about. This, I would. I would that. think that it would be fair to also potentially point out that when he's doing that in a comic vein, that he's being a little satirical and pointing out the absurdity Possibly. of 
writing something off yeah. as a mystery and then saying you shouldn't question it. Yeah. Right. I agree. Okay. So, yeah. I don't know I, if we I made any I progress would... or not, Doc, but <laughs> I, well, I'm going to let you go. I, and I... I was hoping, I guess I was hoping to make progress with you. Okay. And, uh, but. I don't know if I did or not, so I guess we're... To make, to make progress moving me closer towards belief in a God? Uh, no, just doubting your own, um, uh, your I, own claims. I have, I have doubts about everything. What, what are, I, what are I, our own claims? My claim is that people have not presented a good reason for believing yeah. in God, and you just spent 10 minutes okay. agreeing with me. Yeah, back in, I guess back up to the part where uh, you talk about God's teachings on slavery. Yeah. Um, that That's the only thing I was uh, really, that's what I was calling about. I, I don't present them as God's teaching on slavery. I present it as this is what the Bible says that God says about slavery, and yeah. it's immoral. Right. I I agree. And I think they're... Uh, the only the only thing I would have to say about that is that you have to take two different cultures uh, and contrast them. In one culture, slavery was okay, and this is how you should treat people you do own. Now, currently, we don't agree that slavery is okay or any anything like that. No, slavery so, was never okay. The fact that people thought it was well, yeah. means they were people wrong. Thought it was at that time, and and if your if your God was that moral and that all knowing, He surely would uh -huh. have known that slavery was a bad thing for humans. And one of His commandments would have been, "You can never own another human ever. Don't do it." It certainly seems True. a lot more important than many of the commandments which yeah. we currently have. Right, and and if if there's a God well, who can make prohibitions against eating shellfish. Yeah, or wearing <laughs> wearing fabrics yeah. of mixed fibers, or cutting your, think, cut your penis off. Yeah, <laughs> hey, hey, you know, well, this, you would think that it wouldn't is, be that difficult is, for the all knowing, all wise God of the universe to realize there's nothing yeah. wrong with shellfish, but maybe I should tell these people not to fucking own each other. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is where I think I guess we disagree about the uh, the scripture itself. Is that I'm not sure that. Uh, those are all God's commandments and not just the people of the time reiterating what they already thought they knew. Sure. How do you tell and, the difference between and, here's something that somebody said God said and here's something that God actually wants people to understand? How do you tell the difference? Well, that that you almost have to take it on a case by case and Look at each case. Okay, look at each case. What is the method yeah. to tell whether or not something is coming from God or coming from a person that got it wrong? How do, how do you tell? I really don't know. I can't tell you that. If you don't know, then you can never yeah. be in a position where you have any confidence that anything you've ever been told came from God, correct? That's true. That's true. And if you're in that situation, what grounds could you possibly have other than it makes me feel good to believe that there's a God at all? Well, other than other than what I said about the other than having yeah, an experience from the Holy Spirit, which you also acknowledge you can't identify was from a Holy Spirit. Um, the only reason I could identify was from that it was from the Holy Spirit was that I was there, and I knew what pretty much knew what was happening. You knew what was expected uh, of you, because when you go to these the, events, there is an expectation. And so you met the expectation. Yeah, I mean, earlier I asked you how you could tell whether or not the experience was actually from the Holy Spirit, and you acknowledged that you couldn't. You, you have no idea what an ex, what a what At an that experience. Time, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So we're right. kind of stuck. I, I think probably it's good to stick a pin <laughs> in it. You go off and think. I'll okay. go off and think, and then you can call back. And yeah, you can also call in to talk well, Ethan and other stuff. I I will try. Oh, by the way, I do like the. Uh, the one girl that uh, is on, well, she's primarily on Talk Heath, and I've seen her once in a while as a co-host. The it's a she's a young girl. She's an astrophysicist. Or studying to be an astrophysicist. I don't know if you know who I mean. Yeah, they are non-binary, so oh, don't EJ. call them. Yeah, don't call them a girl. E, yeah, e, e, EJ's you know, not well, her. 
Yeah. PJ is they. Yeah, she. she no, uh, no, they. Not, not she. I, I not she. That, they. EJ is non-binary. Yeah. I got that. Okay. And I'm I'm still struggling with that one too. I, I get okay, it. That's so, why we're correcting. We're not yeah. trying to hammer you. We're just. Yeah. We're I, trying to yeah, make I'm, sure that I'm, somebody we know is represented the way yeah. they would prefer to be known. Yeah, I I get you there. Anyway, but, uh, I I can only I can only go what I what comes off the top of my head. So I, that's I got I get that. I, I think we, we reached that conclusion just uh, earlier. But I'm going to let you go, okay. and we're going to take some other calls. Thanks, Doc. Good enough. Thank you. Bye. I, I get it that especially for a lot of people, it is a feeling. Yeah. And to touch on the other subject, for a lot of people, the notion of non-binary is something that is new and foreign, and they don't know right. what to make, how to make sense of it. Um, and... Everybody is everybody is going to make a mistake at some point. Right. Just, hey, whoops, sorry, didn't mean to do that. Right. I will strive to correct that in the future. And yeah. it's not, this is one of the things that Jordan Peterson and I didn't actually talk about, but we may at some point, um, because he's simultaneously pointed out that he doesn't want the government to force him to produce. And I agree, government shouldn't force you to say anything. Right. Uh, but that he is fine using people's preferred pronouns in private and everything else. That wasn't his objection. Okay, cool. Yeah. He, not that he doesn't have 20 other problems related to that. Right. But at the end of the day, um, Teller isn't Teller's real name. Right. Share, you know, pick all these people who are using stage names. You know, oh, I don't have any problem calling my boat she. Right. Her. I got a beautiful boat. She's a wonderful, seaworthy lady. Yes. And yet a boat isn't that. And we do that. So how is it any more difficult to say, ah, these are your preferred pronouns. I will endeavor right. to use them. Please forgive me if I fuck it up from time to time. Right. Because every individual I've ever run across who's using pronouns that don't match with what they would have been assigned at birth mm -hmm. has been incredibly tolerant Yes. And incredibly forgiving and appreciative that people are making the effort. And and EJ is very tolerant of honest mistakes, as are most people in that, like you said, in that situation. They're used to it. Um, and they all understand the but, difference between maliciously, right. intentionally misgendering And just making somebody. a mistake. Yeah. However, one thing that I'm not very tolerant of, this is kind of a pet peeve of me, EJ is not an astrophysicist. They're an aerospace engineer. And how do I know that? Because I'm an aerospace engineer, not an astrophysicist. So. That's all right. With all the things that were wrong in that last call, yeah. I'm, I'm happy that you seized on that one too. Yeah. Rawr! <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think I just broke our limiter on the mic. <laughs> all right, we're going to get to more calls. All right. Um, Jonah, who helped us out before the show with the pre-show pre -show call, thanks for waiting. Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. How are you, Matt? I'm all right. So what's how on your mind? Do you want to ask Jen how she's doing, too? I know I talk yeah. a lot, but we're both here. Well, yesterday <laughs> yeah, was I'm Pride, so I'm guys. fabulous. Go ahead. What have you got for us? Okay. Well, I've been watching your show for, like, more than three years now, and I watch it, like, every night. So the last caller, like... Is a believer, and I think that once they believe in something and they really, really, truly believe in something, they try to find evidence to back up their claims. And all the evidence that goes against it, they don't accept it because deep down they really, really, truly believe what they believe and they want to believe. Yeah, there's some confirmation that, bias going on there. It, this is one of the things I was trying to point out to Doc is it's all well and good to look at the story and say, oh, is there a way I can make this make sense? But you have to ask the underlying question, should I be spending any time trying to make this make sense right. at all? And if I ultimately make it make sense, is it actually going to undermine all of the reasons that I had for caring about whether there was a boat in the first place? Yeah. We know people do this, um, but we also know people can change their mind. I'm sure I did plenty of that uh, during the years when I was a believer, as is almost everybody else at, yep. at different levels. Um, and that's why, you know, shows like this and the debates, they're valuable because people do change their mind. But at the same time, though, we can't blame them because 
sometimes they do it and they don't even know that they're doing it. Of course, yeah. Yeah, the only time I actually blame somebody, and, and, and I will keep this short, people used to ask me when I found my way out, was I mad at my parents or my preachers? Um, and my answer was no. There are people who find their way out and they are very mad at those other individuals. My, right. I view them both as victims um, of the same sort of indoctrination and flawed thinking that I was shown. Um, but there is a point at which I do hold them responsible. And that is if someone has repeatedly, clearly explained the flawed thinking and they stick with it. And this is, this is going to be slightly mean of me because people might think that I'm talking about Doc, our last caller. Uh, I'm not. He managed to agree on all the reasonable stuff and yet still found a way to try to, well, okay, it's just because it makes me feel good. And even when you point out that perhaps that's not the best reason to believe something, yeah. he continues to believe. That is because of what you're talking about. This is something that he values, that makes him feel good. Um, he's not being insincere. He's not in, trying to be dishonest. He just has some... Religion implants a protective mechanism, and they're different for different people and different religions, that helps to make it immune to reason. It's not actually... The, the person isn't immune to reason, by and large. Yeah. It's just... It's a wall you have to really work at. But I, anyway, continue. You know what, like, bothers me sometimes? Mm. Sometimes, like, sometimes, like, like, say 20, 50, 40 years ago, like, they have a story about their religion saying, yeah, this is what God said and this is what God means. And you get what I'm saying? And then, like, 40 to 50 years in the future, their, their stories change. Everything just changed. Oh, yeah. The number so of times like, people have predicted end times events. Right. Her Harold Camping was wrong. Yeah. I don't know how many times. Yep. I actually have... No, they're trying to... Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead, John. You talk. And then, and then no, they're trying to, like, put religion and science together. Like, religious people are trying to mix um, their religion with science to try to make their claims believable. And it's not. Yeah. Well, and they, and they only do but, that when it becomes impossible to hold on to the original claims of religion because yeah. science, the, the evidence for science is so overwhelming. And so they adapt the religion. It, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons Christianity has survived because it, it has this endless ability to adapt itself to new information. Yeah, I write, I write this quote like the other day saying that the fact that Christianity stories keep on changing, that should be evidence of evolution. Like, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, the, the belief, change, you know? yeah, the belief systems certainly evolve. Yeah, you all you, you right. are so, noticing all the things that you know we've of course noticed over the years. Um, it, the the key, which is something that I work on constantly, something you can work on, everybody can, is to how do we get people to see what we've seen about the way they think? And here's the the incredibly frustrating part for me. I've been hosting this TV show for 14 years. I was a believer for a couple decades um, prior to that. I have a pretty good understanding of my thought processes that led me out of religion. And despite that, I can't point to one thing or one epiphany. I can't say this was, you know, I can't even say this was my primary fallacy or this was the thing that was... You know, this was the protective mechanism. I can't, even if I see it in other people, all I can see are aspects of that because I thought for a while I was going to come up, I was going to write a book that was going to be, this is the single silver bullet argument that's going to defeat religion. I mean, this yeah. is monumentally arrogant considering how long we've dealt with this. <laughs> but it was, it was optimistic. It was like, oh my gosh, if we can just figure out what it is that changed my mind and changed Jen's mind and changed everybody else's mind and put that together, we can get it there and we'll have one neat little package and we will end all of this. And the truth is, there's no such thing. No, nah, it's not that easy, man. Nope. No. Not that easy. But, but, but we still get that I'm question. Calling. We still get that question all the time through email and in various venues. People are saying, hey, hey, what's what can I do? What's the best argument for, you know, getting, you know, my parents to stop believing or, you know, my friends to stop believing. 
And there isn't one. You have to talk to the people to find out what it is they actually believe before you can even start to have that conversation. Yep. Yeah, that's true. Uh, on that so note, Jonah, I'm going to call it. I, I, oh, did you have something else? Yeah, I actually called in to talk about um, Christian and the morals and the effects it got on people and all them stuff. Like, I, I think religion is actually dividing our people um, nowadays. Like, it, it, it divides people. Because, for instance, like, I was talking to this girl recently, and, like, we really, really do love each other and stuff. But what I found out is she's a Christian, and she was, like, very, very indoctrinated from, from, like, from she was very, very young. And basically, she's saying that we can't be together unless I am baptized and born again. No matter what, we can't be together. So hopefully you just started like, dating her, and so this is not something that's been going on for a while. Uh, well, I think that's very, very stupid, man. I even was talking to her mom, and her mom was, like, saying, yeah, like, we got to cut off all communication because I'm not a Christian. I do not go to church and, and all of that. And I think it's very, very stupid for, like, this religion to come in and, like, divide our people and saying that because non-believers are, are like, un unmoral. You know, they, they got no morals and stuff. Well, I think that how long, how long were you dating her? Uh, one year. Uh, and, and you just had that conversation? No, like, it's been a conversation from the beginning. But oh, okay. But at the end of the day, I was saying, like, my feelings was, was there, and I will like, try to ignore, like... Yeah, don't, if somebody was, tells you who they trying, are, believe them. Um, and she's yeah, telling I was, you... I was trying to ignore... Yeah. I was trying to ignore, like, my feelings. I was like, yeah, I don't care, man. I, I love this girl. I would talk to this girl. Like, I would even, like, um, you know... Yeah, so... Just, just say I'm a Christian, go to church with her and stuff, like, you know? Yeah, but don't... I, yeah. I don't want to get your... Guys, advice on that? No, walk away. <laughs> I, yeah, Seriously, walk you, away while you yeah, can. I get, I, I get that it's difficult, and I know relationships where it seems to work and work long term, where one person believes something and the other one doesn't. It just depends on how people prioritize it. But Jen's right. If somebody tells you who they are, then believe them. If you think that you can change this person, uh, you may be right. It may yeah. be possible. But it's not necessarily in your best interest. But to me, but but to me, I wasn't like I'm not trying to change anybody. Like, if she want to believe what you want to believe, that's fine. If I want to believe what I want to believe, that's fine. Okay, that's but now but now you're with someone who believes that you are immoral, and and on that front, yeah. it seems to me that the easiest way to address that is to say, please point out how and why you think I'm immoral, because. Yeah, that's I bet it's going to be incredibly difficult for somebody who cares about you to say, ah, here's, here's where I think you're immoral. Because then you have to have the secondary conversation about the foundations of morality and why they're convinced that X is immoral and you're not. And, and you don't think that way. Um, well, the other thing is she's made it clear that you guys can't get married unless you're baptized and you basically become a Christian. Which means you could go get baptized yeah. and you could fake it, but now you're starting a relationship on a lie. Yeah. So she's yeah. making demands of you that are not reasonable. I mean, everyone that I've ever known that has made this work where you had an atheist and a theist in a relationship, the theist has been more of the live and let live. You, you know, you don't have to believe what I believe. You do your thing, I'll the do atheist. my thing. Yeah, or, or, and the theist has been pretty much laid back about the whole thing too. Ah, where it's worked, you're saying. Yeah, yeah. where it's worked. Where it hasn't worked is when the theist demanded you must be of my faith, you must believe in God or we're done. Or the atheist has demanded that the other person... Which is also wrong, by the way. Yeah. And, so, and that may be the conversation care. to have. Say, how would you feel if I said, we can't be together unless you give up Jesus? Yeah. Well, to be honest, I don't care. Like, I don't... I, I know you don't. Or anything like, uh, the, don't the point the is, is... Why should... The, Why should they care? Like what, what exactly. What, well, what, what, that's how you. Yeah. That's how you. That's how you get them to realize that there's a problem with their demands on you, because you, you ask them how would they feel if you tried to put similar demands on them, and they would object and they would say that's unreasonable and unfair. And so, if they're still willing to hold to their demands, now you have someone 
who is always going to view themselves and their religion as the primary foundation for everything else. It's different than if you found a theist that doesn't put that demand on you, the, the type Jen was talking about where the relationship might be able to work. And there's another thing that she believes. She believes that um, God has this perfect guy out there for her, and that guy is going to come, come to her one day. And I'm like, how do you know? And how are you going to know when the guy comes? She said, she don't know, but God will let her know, like in a dream or in a vision. Or yeah. maybe tell her appearance. Yeah, you need to walk um, away from very, this very one. stupid. Like, <laughs> I get what you're saying, Jen. It's very, very uh, stupid. I, I would. I, I mean, yeah. And, and I get that it can be hard, especially if you have feelings for somebody, but, but you need to walk away from this one. Yeah. And one yeah, kind of uh, playing devil's advocate for one minute. Um, relationships end. All of them. Uh, some of them end long before any of us would expect. I'm, uh, as I mentioned a week, two weeks ago, whatever, I'm in the process of going through a divorce. I married somebody uh, who, you know, we're still friends. I still love her. We're, just, we're getting divorced. But we, neither of us believed in God. We didn't put demands on each other like that. And things still happen. Um, getting realistic expe expectations into people's heads about life, partnerships, the afterlife, you know, the, what, what happens with death. These are all areas where religions have essentially, from their de facto privileged position, poisoned our minds about what realistic expectations are. Um, I, I'm in agreement with Jen that, you know, unless something changes in the long term, you are probably better off not in this relationship. But you get to make that decision. And as long as you are continuing with realistic expectations that, hey, there's a really low chance that this is going to work out, but I'm willing to risk it. Okay, now at least one of you is is kind of standing on on reasonable footing. Yeah, that's true. I just wanted to get you guys advice on that, though. Yeah. Well, and good this, luck. Um, I know it's tough. So. Yeah, it is, man. Like this religion <laughs> stuff. Like when growing up, I used to be a believer. Like. I'm just 21 years old right now, and I, growing up, I was a Christian, like, believing God and everything. But once I was, like, um, 15, 16, and hearing all these contradictions in the Bible and saying that God is real and we should not question God or if God would kill us or God would do this and God would do that, like, <laughs> I just couldn't believe it anymore. Yeah. And for Tracy, Tracy said, like, she went through the same thing, similar thing as me, but she learned to her faith for, like, 10 years longer. So I'm like, <laughs> why hold on for it that long? Like for me it was like really instantly like that quick. Yeah. Like Well I mean it's you know? a different process for everyone. So on that note, Jonah, we're going to move on to another caller, but good luck, and remember that uh, you got this advice for free, so there's no refunds and uh, <laughs> no guarantees. Okay, Brad. Thanks. All right. See you guys later, man. Bye. Yeah, there's a couple areas where I'm reluctant to give advice, and that's uh, I'm I'm especially worried about giving advice to somebody else's minor children. Yeah. Cuz I I really wish that there were more atheist kids who could actually talk to their theist parents. I realize mm -hmm. that's not always the case and so sometimes they'll call or email and I'll do the best I can and I know that all the other people that respond to the emails are doing the best they can, but that's a hairy area and and yeah. you have to when I talk about how to make decisions about what action would be moral or immoral. One of the things I, I keep mentioning is you should consider what the world would be like if everybody took the action that you're getting ready to take. Would that make the world better, worse, whatever? And yes, the the golden rule, which attributed to Jesus is actually a crappy version of do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Perhaps it should be do unto others as they would have you do unto them would be a little bit better. Yeah. And I keep thinking, what would, what, what advice would I want someone to give my kid if the roles were reversed? And this putting yourself in somebody else's shoes to evaluate that can help to make sure that you're not just, ah, oh, yeah, your parents are stupid and you're, 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 yeah. you're living in a prison, but, you know, you'll be out of there someday. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can't. Also, I don't want a lawsuit, you know. Yeah. Hey, you told my minor to question everything. 
Yes, I did, and I will stand by that. I will tell everybody on the planet, question everything. Question everything, question authority, and ask questions, challenge your parents. That doesn't mean be an obnoxious, little, disrespectful, disobedient brat. That means question. And parents, by the way, get some better fucking answers. Yep. But I told you so is a shitty answer. Oh, I don't know, but I said so. Do it because I said so. Do it because, oh my gosh. How lazy, that's the laziest parenting ever. Do it because well, I said so. And, <laughs> and I know everybody's going to do it. I'm sure if I ever had kids, I would get frustrated at some point. And the response I get from parents is, you can't reason with a four-year-old. You can. Yes. <laughs> Somebody can. Yeah. And it's funny because now that my son is trying very hard to become a surly teenager, mm. which is hard for him because he's actually a sweet kid. He is. Um, if I ever tell him because I said so or something like that, he just rolls his eyes. He's like, Mom, that's a fucked up answer. <laughs> oh. He's allowed to say that at home. He, he can use that language at home. But, yeah, but, but not, because, not at other places where people are a little stuffy about language. Well, the interesting thing about that is that because we've not restricted his language at home like that, um, he knows exactly when it's appropriate to use that stuff. When yeah. it's not. And it's, so, it's right back to prepare your kids. Yeah. Hey, guess what? You can say whatever you want, but it is going to have consequences on how people view you and treat you. I did a whole video uh, on my atheist debates thing about don't say this word. Yeah. Uh, and how BS that is. Look, I said BS. Yeah. And I didn't say bullshit. Oh, damn. I would say bullshit. Cause yeah. I, I, I'm a fan of colorful language in case people hadn't figured that out. Uh but it's not like I, you know, who was it? Uh, oh, it was Eddie Murphy uh, that did the, you know, hey, it's not like I walk out and just did a curse show. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a number of people who made really good points there, so I won't belabor those. Uh, let's get on to Luke. There we go. Luke in Phoenix. Thanks for waiting. All right. Can you guys hear me? We, we can. can. Awesome. So uh, I guess you saw the preface for my question, and I saw a lot of great examples to pick from. So, so why don't you restate your question for the audience, because they can't well, see well, what we can so see. A question. It's not so much a question, but a statement. Okay. It's, uh, atheists are immoral. Explain why I'm wrong. Would you like me to explain that? Um, I, I'm sure that we'll, we'll have questions, but so sure. you, you're just saying atheists are immoral. Basically, basically, you're saying, please prove that you're not immoral. Yes, well, how are you not immoral then? Okay. Um, I probably am. I don't think, you know, I, I have a good understanding of morality and how to create a moral foundation from a purely secular standpoint and how that's superior to what we get from a lot of religions. But as an individual, I have done things that I consider immoral. And so on that front... Um, I'm convinced that everybody has been immoral. But now we're into like Ray Comfort territory where he says, have you ever told a lie? And when you say yes, then he says, well, what's that make you? And he, uh, that's a terrible version of his accent. But, oh, it makes you a liar. Uh, I don't accept that sort of simple thing that just because you've told a lie that it is reasonable to sum up the entirety of your character as if you're a liar. I've told lies. But I am also and probably far more honest and maybe blunt about it than... I would say the, the average person. I don't have a lot of secrets. I don't try to hide anything. But yeah, I've told lies. Um, so sure, I'm immoral. So you, but do you believe there is such a thing as moral action and immoral action? Or there are things that are moral and immoral? There are moral evaluations of, that we put on actions based on the consequences of those actions with respect to a goal, a foundation of what we would consider to be good, bad, or neither. How is that morally superior to the Bible? Um, to the Bible? Do you think that slavery... Decree, do, you do, do you think that slavery is moral, immoral, or amoral? It's as immoral as communism. Okay, and yet the Bible advocates for slavery. Advocates that, it, that must be practiced or advocates that, that can be practiced? That it can be, that you can own people as property, that you can beat them as long as they don't die within a couple days. What's that? Hello? Yeah. I mean, feedback. Yeah, I, I don't know where that came from. So, would you agree that it is immoral to own people as property? Is it? I, I'm asking you. I, how, well, how, no, if I, I say... I'm from the atheist perspective, no, is it immoral to own somebody? I'm asking yes. you... Yes, it is, but I I'm mean, asking you... 
Why? Hey, hang on. You asked me about how it could be viewed as morally superior to the Bible. So I'm asking a question in order to answer your question. Do you think it is... That's Im- I'm answering the principle. Oh, my God. Do you think it is immoral to own people as property? Do you? I swear to your God I'm going to hang up on you if you keep trying to play this game. I am legitimately... Well, I, 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 am legitimate, I am legitimately sitting here trying to answer your question. I'm not here to play... Question. Do you think it is immoral to own people as property? On what grounds? Goodbye, jackass. <laughs> so, we'll settle this without him because I don't need your help. Right. You serve as your own rebuttal, disqualifying you from conversation. The question is really simple. Do you think it's immoral to own people as property? If your answer is yes, then you are morally superior to the Bible because the Bible does not proclaim that it is immoral to own other people's property. It, it proclaims it as morally permissible. Now, if you and I agree that it is immoral to own people as property, then I would say that we both have a view on slavery that is morally superior to the Bible, which is a direct answer to your question, how can I view this as morally superior to the Bible? If you wanted to have an actual conversation about moral foundations and how I come to my conclusions, we've addressed that countless times on the show. I have videos on my Atheist Debates Project about morality. I've debated the subject of morality countless times. It's really fucking easy to go on YouTube and Google Matt Dillahunty Morality, and you will get all your answers. But you weren't interested in conversation. You were trying to play little games. I don't have to do that. Call a Christian show. They'll agree with you. They'll agree with me. Atheists are immoral. Congratulations. So are Christians, Buddhists, Hindus, everybody else. On that foundation, everybody is immoral. If you want to talk about the foundations of morality and how we go about determining what is moral or what is not moral, we can have that conversation. But if your question is, as it was, very simply, how can you view yourself as morally superior to the Bible? I not only can, but you do too. And as soon as you realize that you would have to acknowledge that my view on slavery is morally superior to the Bible, that's when you started your little bullshit games. So goodbye. But Matt, God didn't tell you, you know, how to be moral. So therefore you must be immoral. Correct. Yeah. I, I can't do anything about whether or not there's a God who thinks I'm immoral. Yeah. If there is a God and he thinks I'm immoral and he wants to punish me, there's nothing I can do about it except say he's wrong. Except say he's a moral thug. He's a gangster. He's a mafioso. Ah, I created the world. I stuck you in it. I made these rules. I didn't offer any reason for them. Some of the rules that I'm actually offering here are things that you not only intuitively know are wrong, but through practice you can show are wrong. Hey, only person you ever had to ask whether or not slavery was immoral is the slave. Yeah. Us- using something like John Rawls' veil of ignorance here, maybe, maybe if he's still listening, he'll actually learn a little bit of something. Uh, John Rawls' veil of ignorance essentially asks you to design the world you want to live in, not knowing who you will be in the world. So if you're trying to decide how much income inequality there are, you have to do it not knowing if you're going to come in on the lower end of the spectrum or the upper end of the spectrum. If you want to decide whether or not slavery is permissible, you have to do it not knowing whether you're going to be the slave owner or the slave. Curiously, when you apply this veil of ignorance, you end up with a much more fair and much more reasonable world. Just like the the prime example, if you have a birthday cake on the table and a bunch of kids around the room and you want to get that cake cut fairly, you hand the, the knife to somebody and you say, you're going to cut the cake, but you get last pick. Right. And all of a sudden that cake gets divided very fairly. Right. This shit is not nearly as hard as the religious people want to make it out to be. But when you call in to ask how you can be morally superior to the Bible, when your book advocates slavery, genocide, makes women second-class citizens, is opposed to natural sexual proclivities of human beings, uh, holds up the notion of eternal torment for finite crimes, substitutionary atonement, the sins of the father being passed on to the children, the idea that there needs to be a blood sacrifice and when we're done slaughtering animals and God turns over his new leaf and becomes the nice turn-the-other-cheek God in the second book, we only need to kill one, which is God who comes down and becomes incarnate to act as a sacrifice, to serve as a substitute, a substitutionary atonement, to make a loophole for rules that he created in the first place. Don't pretend like you're standing on the side of reason. Okay. Hey, we got, uh, oh no, I don't want to do that right now. Let's get uh, Kyle in England, who evidently was on and got dropped, so thanks for calling back, Kyle. Hello. 
Hello. Hi. Oh, that's really awesome to talk to you. Thanks for letting me on. Sure. So what's on your mind? Yeah, um, well, I was saying to the uh, screener before about um, if I had to categorize it, I would say I'm like 99% unconvinced. But say like if I watch the show and I hear uh, when people call in and either yourself, Matt, or Jen, or whoever it is, it kind of makes me, kind of puts my doubt aside. But then when somebody else makes a point, I just sort of think to myself, or oh, is there? So most of the time I'm, I'm unconvinced. But then when I hear somebody saying something, it's sort of like, it's like a switch, it goes on and off all the time. And I, I just struggle sometimes, like I don't know, you know, what what's going to happen or what's not going to happen. And just feel like, as, is there a better way to go about making myself feel a bit better about it? Because I'm always fearful of when I die, what's going to happen. Yeah. Okay. So if I understand your dilemma, it's that you are kind of leaning toward non-belief, but there are things about theism that kind of keep pulling you back in. Yeah. Well, it's more, maybe it's my own, maybe it's my own self that's doing it, but I, I've, I've watched uh, the I've watched two debates what Matt did recently, and sometimes when I hear Theus say, "Oh, it must be God because of this," it can be purely put down to coincidence. Like you know, uh, right. there was one instance where he, he needed money, and people were giving him money, and he was attributing that to God. And it's like things happen all the time, and unless you've got some way to demonstrate it, then why would you believe that? And I also think. You shouldn't believe something unless it can be shown, or you know, there's more than enough okay. uh, I, I, palpable stuff. I just, I don't know. I just always question myself because of what people say. Sometimes it's not necessarily what they show me; it's what they say. Well, questioning yourself is not a bad thing. Correct. Um, and this whole idea of deconversion—it's not something that you flip a switch and it's done. At least, not for most people. It is a process, and so. You're going to hear a lot of arguments, and some of them may seem convincing. And so the the thing to do is just go and investigate them. You know, if someone makes a claim, go and investigate it, see what evidence supports it and what doesn't, and then make a decision based on that. I, I think there's three points in what you said, um, and I could be wrong. But yeah, one of them I'm is <laughs> one one of them is that. You, like every other person, is struggling with the notion of, I don't know. It is incredibly frustrating to have something that, especially when other people think they do know um, or claim that they know, and you are still in a position of uncertainty or you are unconvinced, um, that is incredibly annoying. And yeah. everybody struggles with that. But there's another thing here, which is you seem to be viewing this as if if you came as if atheism is, I am now convinced that there is no God and I will never change my mind. And that's not remotely what any of us are advocating. The atheism in its minimal sense is, I am not convinced that there is a God. And at no point would either of us or anybody associated with the show suggest that you should never change your mind. The, the day a caller calls in with a valid and sound argument supported by evidence that I that would clearly be reasonable and convincing. I'm not an atheist anymore. I don't think it's yeah. likely to happen, but I'm not sitting here going, that can't happen, that'll never happen, I'll never change my mind. As a matter of fact, there was a comment left on one of my YouTube videos the other day where I was talking about Bible contradictions. Mm -hmm. And this person started off by calling me closed-minded and then finished their post by saying, if you think you found a contradiction, you're wrong because there are no contradictions. Now, that person literally demonstrated what it means to be closed-minded. Yeah. That it is impossible for you to find a contradiction. Well, it may be true that there aren't any contradictions, but what they demonstrated was closed-mindedness. The time to believe something is after there's a good reason. And so I understand fully, especially if, you know, you probably haven't spent your life studying all of these things. And so somebody says something and, hey, the best explanation for that is God. And intuitively, especially if you've been raised around religion, it feels like it's an explanation. And the key for me to that is it is not. When we explain things, we give an account for why something is based on other things that we know and understand. So 
it, 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 if you just appeal to a mystery, a mis- you're trying to solve a mystery by appealing to a bigger mystery. You haven't had it added anything to the equation that that provides any edification or any understanding. If you say, why is there something rather than nothing? And the answer is, because God did it. You haven't explained anything. You have dismissed the question. And the reason to do that is because the real answer to why, as far as I can tell, why is there something rather than nothing is, I don't know. Maybe it's the case that it couldn't have been any other way. Uh, Maybe I'm never going to have an explanation. But that is not very comforting. When somebody says God did it, not only does that seem like they've given an account for it, but they've added a bunch too, and yet they haven't explained a thing. So for me, the yeah. advice to you, um, keep thinking, keep having the conversations, keep watching debates, keep reading, keep engaging with people, and recognize that you are not under any obligation at any point forever for the rest of your life to say, boom, I've now made up my mind and this is what I believe and blah, blah, blah. Just recognize that occasionally you're going to have to be in a position, which is very uncomfortable, which is, I don't know. Or I'm not convinced anybody else does either. There's well, nothing wrong with not being convinced that other people don't know. Right. And, and this is interesting because this came up yesterday while we were at the Pride booth. Somebody came in, all very sure of himself, and said, so, you're atheist. So what do you think happened before the Big Bang? Or what started the Big Bang? And we're like, we don't know. And you don't either. And so then that actually started a a further conversation. And in the end, I think he walked away. He's still a theist, but he's got some, some room for doubt. Yeah. I just like, I've, I mean, I'm in England, so it's it's pretty comfortable to be a non-believer, but I used to be taken to church when I was a kid. I never understood why it was a man or a woman that was trying to tell me all this stuff. Like if it's supposed to be so, powerful why is it just a guy he's telling me why is there nothing more yeah right know, why why does paul get a damascus road experience with god and nobody else does right. everybody else gets it second hand third hand fourth hand yeah why can't you just show up yeah. at the place and just stand there and then you know yeah. the deity like beams the knowledge in what is God afraid of? I, don't know. I mean i've been hosting yeah. this show for 14 years you've been on for what nine ten 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 yeah we have an audience there are millions of people who've watched clips from the show or full episodes, everything else. It's not the biggest audience ever. I mean, he could go like on America's Got Talent or something if he wanted to and say, hey, you know, I'm God, here I am. Maybe get a bigger audience. But what could possibly be more beneficial than coming on to an atheist TV show, right. instantly converting the hosts and the crew, having us change our, our show uh, to block out the A, mm-hmm. and then becoming... Advocates, what could be more convincing than the people who were staunchly in opposition to religion, the people who were constantly providing uh, good rebuttals, pointing out fallacies in arguments, pointing out objections? If I were God, well, first of all, if I were God, which is the title of the book I'm working on, uh, I think I would probably just... get a winning lottery ticket if you was? Well, I'd just reveal myself to people and talk to them directly because... You know, I'm kind of straightforward. But if I had been hiding, as God has apparently been doing, uh, world champion in hide-and-go-seek. Hide-and-go-seek. <laughs> yeah. If I had been hiding, I think that if I saw this show and saw that it was taking my believers away from me, I might realize that I had made a mistake in hiding, and then I'd come on the show and talk. So, by the way, God has an open invitation to... Well, I would say call, but we can't confirm that. So you need to actually like appear in person here. Uh, but you're welcome. I'll, I'll give well, you the whole show. There's a, there's a guy that has made a couple of comments on um, the Atheist Experience Facebook page that says he has a 100% success rate at getting people to, to come to God. And he's praying for Tracy to reconvert. And he said, it's definitely going to happen, definitely going to happen by the end of this year, because we pinned him down and asked for a timeline here. So I, I don't make decisions, by the way, about who is or isn't on the show. This isn't my show. This is the Atheist Community of Austin show. I know I'm on all the time. If Tracy converts before the end of the year, I will lobby, like, and I don't think I'll get too much pushback, that Tracy should stay on the show. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And oh, uh, until we fix that. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't mean fix it as in fix her, but I know Tracy very well. 
Yeah. I'm unconvinced. I think that if Tracy becomes convinced, there would be good reason for me to pay a lot of attention and have conversations with yeah. her. Yeah, I would definitely one of us want is to wrong. have that conversation with her. One of us is wrong, and we we have the sort of relationship where those conversations uh, yeah. could be productive. Yeah. But. Yeah. Anyway, Kyle, so, don't beat yourself up over it. You don't know anybody in explanation. You don't have to come to a decision. Try to get a little more comfortable with being in a position where you don't know and you're not certain because I hate to tell you, you're going to be in that position a lot for the rest of your life. Yeah. yeah. Well, before you leave me go, I'd just like to say thanks to the people that were taking the calls and in fact let me get on. And Matt, I think you're awesome. Jen, I think you're awesome. And yeah. I always watch your debates and everything. So I just want to thank you because you really have made me more aware and more knowledgeable, so I really appreciate it. Well, we think okay. we think you're right. Because I think Jen's awesome, too. So you, you have to be right. And of course, Matt's awesome. And so if you're right about one thing, that means you're right, right? This is this is the response to Ray Comfort when, when he says the, oh, have you ever told a lie? That makes you a liar. Okay, have you ever told the truth? Ooh. Boy, that shut him up real quick. But anyway, <laughs> thanks, Kyle. Have a good day. Yeah, yeah. yeah, thanks a lot. Take care, guys. Yeah, I love that. By the way, that's not original to me. That was actually, I, if I remember correctly, because this is many years ago, that took place on the Hellbound Alley show. Mm -hmm. They had Ray on as a guest, and they talked to him about the banana thing. And when they asked him, Ray, have you ever told the truth? It, it was, I, like, <laughs> I could almost physically see the light bulb going off over his head just from listening. And he's like, oh, that's a good one. <laughs> Something like that. that. I was going to say, I would think that light bulb exploded over his head. All right, we got uh, Joel in West yeah. Palm Beach. Thanks for waiting. Oh, one last thing. Yeah, I, 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 need to, I was supposed to promote this when the show started, and now the show is like three minutes from ending. Uh, so for next time, uh, there's a Discord server set up so that people can actually interact, uh, not necessarily with us, but with other people involved in the show. Yeah. And it's tinyurl.com slash talk discord with a capital T and a capital D, and there may be a logo that they'll put up. Anyway, we're short on time, but go ahead, Joel. We'll try to do our best. Okay. Um, uh, my point is it's just really, really quick. It is something that I've seen so many atheists, uh, and, and uh, they say this, that this has never existed. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in my case, I went to a secular divinity school, and uh, I'm trained in Greek, in Greek and, and Latin and so on. So I got this book from um, one scholar, and he actually counted 6,000 plus scholars. I mean, universally, every scholar, teaching scholar, teaching scholar, not every scholar, but every teaching scholar in classics, ancient history, New Testament, early Christianity, etc., they all convey and say, yes, Jesus existed. Yeah. Do you, do you know why? Well, because there's overwhelming evidence. No. Yes. No, that's not the reason why. There may, in fact, be... I wasn't saying there's not evidence. I'm saying that's not the reason why. The reason why is that from a historical perspective, if someone is portrayed as a nonfiction actual character who existed, the default is just to accept that that's the case. Now, of those scholars, you see, on my, my position, I'm not convinced that Jesus existed. I'm also not convinced he didn't exist. I lean probably more to the fact more to the side that there was probably a person. Um, but if you take and you list everything that is claimed about Jesus, and then you cross out all the things that we can't possibly demonstrate, um, you're left with, there's an itinerant Jewish rabbi named Yeshua ben Joseph who taught some people and people yeah. agreed, which is a totally mundane. Um, and it doesn't matter to me whether that person existed or not. However, it does matter immensely to the foundations of Christianity because if it turns out he didn't exist, then there was no sacrifice. Right. And or if it turns out he, the guy that they've said is Jesus is sort of an amalgamation of the probably hundreds of itinerant rabbis going around no, practicing I, some salvation yeah. message. Then, yeah, then the foundation crumbles. No, I disagree with that because there's, there's only one guy... And the evidence is overwhelming. I mean, we have... Well, if it were overwhelming, calls, we, then we would actually believe that this character, Jesus, existed. And when, what do you mean when you say there was only one guy? 
Well, there's only one guy, and I'm going by what the the universal consensus of scholars. I'm sorry, not I, I don't give a rat's ass about the of scholars. I don't give a rat's ass about the universal consensus of scholars. I'm asking, what do you mean when you say there was only one guy? Well, there's only one guy portrayed in the Gospels, and you also have the evidence uh, from Paul, and you also have the historical evidence that is outside. Yeah, you, here's the facts, Joel. And if you go and yes. poll these historians that you want to cite, they will recognize these facts. Paul never met the person Jesus. That's a fact. That's straight out of the okay. Bible. Paul, Paul's never represented that. Secondly, there is no extra biblical evidence of that is contemporary with the accounts that confirms the existence of Jesus. Zero, none, not a zilch, zilch zero. Not, not, okay. one, not one contemporary account confirms anything about his life. This is why the mythicists have a foundation to begin with, even if they're wrong, even if there was somebody. It's because there's okay, not a then, single, not a single contemporary account outside of the Bible confirms anything at all about Jesus. Okay, then we can then say that uh, Julius Caesar was not assassinated because we have non uh, 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 records uh, uh, of when he was assassinated at the time. Sure. And the four records that we have, Seneca, Diocasius, Plutarch, and Suetonius, they all contradict each other massively. Yeah, so just like the Gospels. Safely conclude. But let's assume. Yeah, so, so, so let's then, assume. Then we can, then, Joel. Then we can safely Joel. conclude. Then we, Joel. We can safely conclude. Okay. Joel. Let's assume you're right. Let's assume that you're right, that we can. We don't have any reason to believe that Julius Caesar existed. What do we do with that? No, that's irrational. I, I, don't, I don't have to. I'm not ever going to say that he didn't exist because he's irrational. Well, you just made an argument that we don't have good foundation to accept that he existed. And I'm saying, if that's the case, what do you do with that? You, you can't just come back and say, oh, I'll no. never accept that. He, that that's no, you. Because, now, because now you're just preaching and closed minded. I'm trying to get to the foundation no. of this. Yes. No, 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 not at all. Because yes, yes, at all. The, his, the historical methods. That's the reason why we use the historical methods to actually arrive to what yeah. is historically accurate Joel, and what yes. is not accurate. Joel, you're not paying attention. I pointed out that I'm not someone who thinks that Jesus didn't exist. Oh, okay. I'm, okay, I'm sorry. I'm fine with the idea that there may have been a person. What do we know about that person reliably? Do we have evidence that they were divine? Do we have evidence that they actually healed the sick? Do we have evidence that they raised somebody from the dead? Do we have anything that would point to their divinity other than, hey, here's a person? We don't even have good evidence that they were actually crucified. Well, I, uh, we, we don't have enough evidence that he was crucified, uh, you said? Right. Y yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, you got Well, you can appeal to your God all you want, but yeah, I'd actually but you'd rather you appeal to some fucking evidence. What yeah. evidence do you have that Jesus was crucified? Is there a record outside of the Bible at all? Oh. Appeal to silence. Yes. Not a fallacy. Just really useful. On that note, we're going to wrap this up. I think if you're still on the line, I think they may want us to take the last couple calls in an after show thing as a bonus. But I appreciate uh, everybody coming and hanging out with us. On the other side of the glass, uh, I won't be here next week. I think Tracy's hosting next week. Tracy's hosting next week. That's right. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. It's been a Pride, week. condoms, morals, slavery. Yeah. And gosh, there's a lot of evidence for this Jesus guy. I just can't believe yes. that you guys wouldn't believe this foundations for your Maybe beliefs. Maybe we'll do better next time. Bye-bye. Yeah.